Hello there. Uh, in the last lecture, we started talking about earthquake response of multi degree of freedom systems, and I introduced you to two different ways of uh, solving uh, the problem. Uh, and let me just rephrase uh, uh, that we are again looking at earthquake response of multi degree of freedom structures. Please note that I, I it, it, it behooves me to add over here that there is a lot more to uh, earthquake response analysis than what I am doing. I am just taking a, a, an overview of, of just two lectures to give you an overview of earthquake response of multi degree of freedom systems. Uh, please note that there is actually a completely separate course uh, available in this particular uh, format, uh, which is known as introduction to earthquake engineering. And that is the course in which uh, you will be given a much more detailed uh, background behind earthquakes, why earthquakes, what are the characteristics of earthquakes, how do we take those, how do we re and analyze the response to those. Those are things that will be done in earthquake engineering. I am just using earthquake response as really an example and it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a very important example because the entire uh, idea of structural dynamics of multi degree of freedom systems actually came out in structural engineering, actually came out of the need to analyze the earthquake response and wind response of uh, multi degree of freedom systems of buildings. That's where the entire thing came about. So I'm just utilizing that as an example or to introduce uh, several concepts. And let us now go back and look at uh, something that I discussed uh, last time, but I'm going to, uh, you know, put it down in a more formal way. The formal way is this, that you're given that if I say, if I say, I know that my y n of t is equal to L n upon M n into, I'll call that now as the single degree of freedom ok. So, this is the, the V single degree of freedom T is nothing but 1 upon omega 0 to T V G tau H T minus tau D tau. So, this is we know that this is the response of a single degree of freedom. Okay. So, you know I can call that you know in, in a way. So, that is my y n of t and my v n of t is equal to l n upon m n into phi n into y n of t. We also found out that the f s n of t that is the, so this is the displacements relative to ground. Please understand that these are the displacements. These are the equivalent static loads. These are the equivalent static loads that give the displacement relative to the ground that we have over here. And this we saw was equal to L n upon M n omega squared m 
mn into phi n y n of t. Okay? And the specific form of Bayes shear in the nth mode is equal to ln squared mn squared into omega n squared into y n of t. So, these are the things that we have evolved and therefore, if I look at what I call as the response history method. So, this is known as the response history method. The response history method is based on the following y n of t is equal to l n upon m n. Okay. Let me define a, a, a particular term. Okay. Let me define a y hat n. A y hat n is a, that single degree of freedom problem that I have, which is minus 1 upon omega. So, that I am just kind of uh, so, what I have is y n of t is equal to l n into y hat of t. Okay. So, then, then I can say that look just like I have this situation, where if I take let us say V i n. I want to find out the displacement of the ith floor displacement relative to ground. What would that be equal to V n of i t? It would be equal to L n upon M n into phi i n into y n hat into t, okay, because it is just nothing but phi i n into y n of t. So, this is what I get. Okay. Suppose, I want to find out base shear that is equal to v bay n of t is equal to l n squared upon m n omega n into y n hat of t. The point here is that we see that there is a quantity given any response quantity, given any response quantity what we get is R n of t is equal to I will call that the participation factor into that single degree of freedom response. Okay. Where this I will call it as the modal participation factor for R. Note that the modal participation factor depends on which response you are looking at. For example, if I was looking at the ith floor displacement, my this is my xi n. If I was looking at the base shear, this is my xi n. For any, any response quantity, you can actually find out a, a scalar, okay, which will have, you know, l n, m n, well, all kinds of things, you know, depending on it would definitely have l n upon m n, but it would have other other terms also associated uh, with it. It would have definitely l n upon m n because y n is l n upon m n into y hat. Okay, so therefore l n upon m n is always there, but there's other terms. For example, if it's the i th floor displacement, the other term is phi i n. Okay, if it is uh, base shear, the other term is l n into omega n squared. Okay, so that's that's all. I mean, you know, we can always find out a participation factor, 
and if you find out the uh, this thing participation factor, then the total response time history is actually by classical mode superposition. This is nothing but mode superposition. So, this in essence is your response history analysis. What do you do? Well, given given a acceleration time history, base acceleration time history, okay, you first find out the y n uh, hat which is given uh, in uh, in this form. Okay? Or you somehow find out y n hat which is essentially the single degree of freedom displacement. Okay? Then you want to find out any other quantity. Well, uh, it is always a participation for any response quantity find out the participation factor and this participation factor is independent of the ground motion. It is just a a modal participation factor which depends on uh, you know ln ln is nothing but a phi n transpose m into 1 okay m n which is phi n transpose m phi n okay or it's phi i n or it's omega n in other words it's it's parameters that are given once you know a particular mode and they are different for different modes so you your 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 psi n that you have over here which is the modal participation factor will be different for different modes and will be different for different response quantities but anyway it's it's a quantity that depends only on modal properties this depends only on modal properties okay so this you can always find out given this thing and you multiply that with the single degree of freedom and what you have is the modal response and then you use mode superposition to find out the response time history uh, of that response. This in essence is the background of the response history method. Okay? Now let us look at the other method that we have looked at but I want to uh, you know put down on paper and that is the response spectrum method okay response spectrum method in the response spectrum method what you have is actually these parameters let's see uh, suppose you want to find out y n y n hat max that is a single degree of freedom y n hat max is nothing but s d omega n and psi. So, these depend on the modal parameters and so and the deformation response spectrum. So, y n max is this. So, what is y n max equal to y n max is equal to l n upon m n into y n hat max which is s d omega n xi. So, if I were to look at v i n max that is the peak displacement at ith floor relative to ground. Please remember that uh, this is always relative to ground. Okay? So, this is going to be equal to L n upon M n into phi I n which is the ith term of the nth mode into S d omega n xi n and you know if I look at the base shear in nth mode. So, this is base shear in nth mode okay, is equal to 
ln squared upon mn into S A omega n xi. And here now you can't use mode superposition, so you have to use what are known as modal combination to go from to get V B the peak value of R. So therefore, even here I can write that R n max is equal to actually xi n into S d omega n. I could do that, right? So, that xi n parameter still remains. So, R b max will be given in terms of R n max, okay? all R n max n going from 1 to n using modal combination rule. Okay? So, this in essence is the response spectrum method where you are only given the response spectra, displacement spectra, uh, you know acceleration spectrum, typically you are only given acceleration spectrum, but you can always find out displacement spectrum from the pseudo acceleration spectrum. Okay? And the modal combination rules just again to uh, restate that particular thing, modal combination rules, there are the absolute sum, which is R max is equal to summation n going from 1 to n R n max and you have the square root of the sum of the squares where r max is equal to okay these were rules that were developed and which seem to give very good results and so they were used okay srss is the most commonly used, most commonly used for building frames. Why? Because, well, you know, what, what they did was that they did the response history analysis, obtained, uh, you know, sorry, response history analysis got r of t and found out the peak of r of t okay and then saw well let's look at rn of t look at peak rn of t and they saw that well if i used the srss rule the r max that i got from the this came closest to the true r max that's how they did it okay till this was used in the 60s and 70s extensively Till in the uh, you know mid uh, early to mid 80s, uh, when they were looking at random vibrations, etc. I don't want to discuss that. They did some very uh, interesting uh, things and found out that this is only valid when only valid when frequencies omega n are well separated. Now, typically, why? You know, see, for frames, uh, the first few modes, which is what is considered, you don't call, consider all the modes, you actually consider the first few modes. The first few modes in frame structures, the frequencies are well separated. Okay? So, therefore, uh, this was done in a heuristic sense and when this check that SRS has worked fine, uh, it was that they used it, uh, you know, this is valid for building frames. So, therefore, it was a fulfilling, self-fulfilling prophecy, okay. Uh, recently, uh, they have looked at another modal combination rule. I will just 
just lay out the parameters. The parameters, it's called the CQC rule. This is complete quadratic combination complete quadratic combination and this rule says that look r max is equal to double sum n going from 1 to n n going from 1 to m rho m n r n max into r m max. where rho m n is a correlation factor that is a function of omega n, omega m and xi. Okay, I am not going to give you those values because it is not relevant. It is just that it suffice to say that it depends on uh, omega n, omega m and xi. Now, let us look at this. Suppose, suppose in this particular one, okay, I take the situation that rho m n is equal to 1. By the way, you know correlation rho m n is, is equal to 1, it satisfies rho m n is equal to 1 when m equal to n this is a property because correlation is perfect when you have the same mode. So, this is a property. Okay. Suppose I say now that rho m n is equal to 0 for m not equal to for all m not equal to n. Let us see what happens. Let us plug it in. I know that rho m n is equal to 1. It is known when n is equal to m. So, that means it becomes r n into m that is r n x squared. Okay? And note that all m n for not m not equal to n is 0. So, if you look at this double summation, what does this become? This double summation then CQC implies that R max is equal to, note that the double summation only the term m equal to n lasts. So, this then becomes a single summation n equal to 1 R n m x squared S R S S. Okay. Now, this correlation factor rho m n tends to 0 when omega n and omega m are well separated. This is part of the function. So, as it tends to 0 when they are well separated, that means it becomes S R S S. So, S R S S is actually included the square root of the sum of the squares modal combination rule is actually embedded into the complete quadratic combination rule, the CQC rule, okay? which is why today uh, in the world, okay, we tend to use the CQC rule. Why? Because, well, if they are not well separated, CQC rule gives a better estimate. And if they are well separated, it, it kind of automatically becomes an SRSS. Okay, so, we do not have to completely separate it out uh, and use it. Okay? So, this in a sense is modal combination and modal combination rules are essential in any method that computes only modal peaks and not modal time history. And the response spectrum method is based on only computing modal peaks and so, if you have modal peaks, the only way that you can tackle this problem is by applying a modal combination rule. Okay. So, this 
you know, so therefore, coming back to it, we have two methods for earthquake response analysis of multi degree of freedom system problems. We have the response history method, which I have enumerated, okay, and we have the response spectrum method, okay, where uh, in, uh, you know, uh, in the response history method, you can use the standard mode superposition and get away with it. The response spectrum method, on, we only get modal peaks, and if we get modal peaks, then the only way that you can combine is by using modal combination rule. Please note something that I have used earthquake response as an example. Let us say that you want to find out, okay, you, you, you have a shock, shock uh, load and you are given the shock spectrum, okay, which is essentially what? T n upon T d, okay, T upon T d, T was the, so it is really T n upon T d. Now, there also, what are you computing? You are computing the modal peak. Single degree of freedom, you get peak response. See, we showed, when we looked at it, we tried to develop time history and then later on, you know, if you, if you, if you look at harmonic, simple harmonic, what did we do? We said, okay, we draw the mod, modal uh, amplification factor, okay, and then, okay, uh, we are able to uh, look at uh, the variety of uh, things that we have and therefore, uh, the point then becomes that the entire thing, if you look at my single degree of freedom problem, okay, the entire thing, let us just look back at it. Okay, uh, if you have a harmonic response, you have the displacement response factor. So, therefore, now you look at it omega bar upon omega n. So, for every frequency, you find out omega bar upon omega n and find out the displacement uh, peak displacement response factor multiply by the modal factors. You have got the modal peaks. Okay? You look at the shock spectrum. What you do is, it is T d upon time period of the structure. So, it is really T d upon T n. So, therefore, you know, you look at any specific kind of load. You find out T d upon T n and you look at it, read it off. You have got the static response ratio. You multiply that by uh, P n naught, you know. So, so, these are all things that are based on finding peaks. Whenever you find out modal peaks, okay, whenever you find out modal peaks, the only way that you can find out the total response peak is by using modal combination rules. So, therefore, although I used, I used earthquake response to illustrate modal combination rules, please understand that this is equally valid when we look at uh, 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 other response also. So, you know, these are typically the kind of problems that you land up. Uh, in, in the next classes, next couple of classes, I shall actually look at some uh, example problems of shock spectra, of harmonic loads uh, and, uh, you know, earthquake loads. Well, earthquake loads, I do not need to, but to show you that modal combination is fundamental to response analysis of multi degree of freedom systems. Because in single degree of freedom systems, remember what we said? We were not interested in the time history. Okay? We were interested really in peak responses. Okay? So now, if you are interested in peak responses, we you know, and you see the single degree of freedom in a multi degree of freedom is really the modal amplitude. So, essentially we get only the peak modal amplitude. Okay? And once we get the peak modal amplitude, every response quantity in a particular mode is connected with the modal amplitude. So, you only get the peak values. So, any time you get the modal peaks, any response analysis procedure that only gives you modal peaks, Okay, the only way that you can compute the total peak, the actual response peak, okay, because ultimately mode is just, you know, ultimately you do mode superposition. Well, the only way that you can superpose modes to get the total response, the total peak response is by using modal combination. And I have looked at three modal combination without stating anything specific. The absolute sum is something that I normally do not use, 
we always use the complete quadratic combination or the SRSS. And as I said, SRSS is incorporated in, um, in CQC, so there is no need to uh, go about it. Only thing is that, you know, the first thing in any response analysis is you do free vibration analysis. Now, if you see your frequencies are well separated or at least the frequencies that you need to consider are well separated, then you do not need to look at specifically uh, the problem of um, using CQC. You just use SRSS, okay, and then go about it. Now, I will, you know, remember I had talked about something last time where I had said that maybe uh, how many modes to consider. One of the things of modal superposition is how many modes do I consider. And in an earthquake, you know, you can actually find this out very, very easily. Let's look at for base shear. And now I'm going to drop the max because anytime I put in, uh, you know, SA, it's automatically max. Okay. VBN max is equal to ln squared upon MN into and we'll call this SAN. SAN is nothing but, which is, you know, this term is equal to SA of omega n given as I value. Okay. So, this is your parameter. Now, this ln squared, ln squared upon MN. Okay. If you look at it, what is ln? ln is phi n transpose m into 1. Okay. So, if I look at it, ln squared is actually phi n transpose m 1 into 1 transpose okay, m phi n. Okay. Now, this can be shown and, and what is m n? m n is equal to phi n transpose m phi n. Okay. It can actually be shown that for frame structures, summation n going from 1 to n ln squared m n is equal to summation m i, i going from 1 to n, nth floors. Total mass of structure. Now, total mass of structure is something that we can always evaluate given a given a given a structure. Okay, so if I look at it, uh, I'll I'll get this kind of a situation. That let me first find out i going from 1 to n. This is an n story frame okay, and m i is story mass. So, this is equal to total mass. Total mass of building. Total mass of building that is not at the base. So, it is the total mass. If there is any at the base, that is not to be included in the total mass of the building. Okay? So, you can always find out the total mass of the building. Find out the total mass of the building. Okay? Then, so this is the total mass of the building. Okay? Then, you, you know this. This is a term that you know. Then, what you do is you find out ln squared upon m n. You can find that out okay? and keep doing it, adding it. Adding the first mode, the second mode, the third mode, keep adding it. So, find out this parameter okay, for 
n equal to 1, 2. Now, if you do ln squared upon mn, mn divided by m, okay, this gives you nothing but percentage of participating mass in nth mode. Okay. So, now this is the percentage okay, because this is like this will become like uh, first mode okay, is going to be 83 percent. We say that first mode contains 83 percent of this. This is actually ln squared upon n squared upon the total mass that in is a factor that into 100 of course is percentage. Okay. So, this way what happens is what you do is you find out for each mode you find out ln squared upon m n upon m. These are quantities that you can find out for each mode. Now, typically the way this goes is that n equal to 1, okay, this value is anywhere from 70 to 90 percent depending on how the load is, uh, you know, how the mass is distributed. Okay, that is how it is, n equal to 2. It can be anywhere from 5 to 20 percent, n equal to 3. It keeps going down. It will be anywhere from 1, you know, 2 to about 5 percent. Okay. It keeps going as you go further and further. So, what you do is you add you keep adding them and then what happens is as soon as you hit 95 percent of participating mass stop that many number of modes you consider. So, you see for earthquake response analysis and if it is force response, you have a specific way of computing how many modes should I consider, how many modes should I consider. And although this is strictly valid for earthquake, okay, this is something that is used in general uh, to say that look, but but if the, if the, you know this is understand that what kind of a loading is it? It is a inertial loading. It's equal loading. For that, this one is valid. Okay, if the loading that you have is fairly uniform over the height of the building, then you can use this, irrespective of what kind of load it is. If it's fairly uniform, you can use this uh, to get the number of modes. If 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 the loading increases with height, okay, this will always underestimate the response of the lower modes. So, in other words, if you use this procedure to calculate the number of modes that you are going to be considering in this uh, in your analysis, okay, in the modal analysis, modal analysis, okay, mode superposition, mode uh, response spectrum, whatever any mode superposition based method. Okay. Uh, if you compute m based on participating mass, okay, as long as it is uniform or increasing okay, uh, in, in, in the spatial variation of the load, if it increases, then this is a very valid way of computing how many modes should I consider in the analysis. Okay. Now, the problem that happens is if there is any, any other kind of complicated loading pattern, spatial loading pattern, okay, this then becomes a problem. But understand that in structural engineering, uh, the typical kind of uh, loading for which this was considered was essentially wind load and earthquake load, environmental loads. Okay. So, if you are looking at environmental loads, this is a perfectly valid way of computing how many modes should I consider by looking at participation mass. Because 
in, 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 in terms of uh, earthquake load, you have uniform load because m into 1, remember, uniform loads. And you have, uh, uh, you know, in, in wind load, you have increasing load with height and that actually you require less modes. But if you consider more modes, there's nothing wrong with it. And still consider the fact that since the first mode has about 70 to 80 percent, even if you have many degrees of freedom, pretty much within, you know, 10 or 15 modes, you will have hit 95 percent. Or if it's a very, very complex structure, as I said, remember I was telling, telling you yesterday, I had a 1500 degree of freedom structure where I had to consider 50 modes. Well, this is how I actually computed the 50 modes that I needed to consider. Okay? This is almost incorporated in a lot of codes which say that these are the number of modes that you consider. Okay? So this in a sense is, gives you an overview of what you have to do for uh, you know, modal combination, how many modes do you consider, okay? how, how, how do you combine when you have modal peaks, how do you combine those. So in, in a sense, although I talked, I illustrated all of this using uh, earthquake, but I did not go too much in detail into the earthquake, excepting to identify that there are two methods, response history and response spectrum. But then you see response spectrum method essentially led me to modal combination rules and the modal combination rules are really valid for all kinds of uh, loads that you have and uh, you know these are the kinds of things that you have. So this in a sense gives you an overview of response analysis for multi-degree of freedom uh, problems. Okay? With, with I used as an example uh, the earthquake response as an example. Please note that, that I have not, earthquake response does not end here. You know, there are many other aspects that are to be included into earthquake analysis. And as I said, that is best covered, this is a structural dynamics course. So I do not give overemphasis on earthquake. Okay. However, I use earthquake because it's something that we have a handle on and it also introduces us to the concept of response spectrum, etc., etc. But uh, to, for detailed earthquake response, please do not look at this course. Please look at the course on introduction to earthquake engineering. So here, earthquake is just an example. I do not go any further with earthquake. Okay, so now we have looked at multi-degree of freedom problems and we actually have looked specifically at framed frames. Okay, and all my, although some of the development that I did, you could do it for anything, you know, because, you know, as long as you can calculate the mass matrix and the stiffness matrix and the load vector for any kind of finite element model, you should be able to solve it using the response history or the direct integration procedure, okay, where you have to now come back. You have to define damping, C, and we all also discussed on how to develop the damping matrix if you are not using the mode superposition so that it is consistent with mode superposition and the fact that xi, uh, the damping, is really a constant across all modes. Okay, so all of these are things that we have looked at, but you know, by and large, our our entire focus has been on frame buildings. Because if you remember, even in the equations of motion, okay, I looked at beam column element and how to develop the for the element level stiffness matrix and mass matrix and how to put it together in a uh, 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 overall uh, sense. Okay, now. You can actually get for any element, as long as you use a finite element, you can actually get an element mass matrix, element stiffness matrix, element load vector, and then put them all together, okay, uh, into a, a structure level formulation. So, in other words, nothing that I have done is not valid, okay. However, I've kind of uh, stayed uh, more and more on uh, framed uh, kind of structures. So let me end today's lecture by just introducing you to the concept of a building. And let me take the specific example of a one-story building, just to illustrate, 
Okay, and nothing more than just illustrate the concept. Let us take an, uh, the, so I am essentially looking at a building now. And you people must have seen that a building you can do a 2D analysis or a 3D analysis. This is something that all of you must have been aware of. A 2D analysis is nothing but frame analysis, which we have already looked at extensively. Now, let us look at, since I am, you know, I, was, I'm, I, I always say that, you know, all that we are going to look at is going to be illustrated with building structures. I have already done the 2D analysis for a building actually, okay? uh, because in, in 2D analysis you just take frame by frame okay? and you take uh, participating mass etcetera, etcetera. These are standard techniques and you do a frame analysis something which I have already looked at. Now, let us look at 3D analysis and the question becomes when, how, Okay, so this is how we are going to look at right now, and I'm just going to introduce the concept. Okay, we'll we'll solve problems uh, uh, later on about how to go about this. I'll take some example problems and solve them. Okay, but when do we do 3D analysis? When we do 3D analysis is typically a situation where you have a building, and I'm going to just look at the plan of the building. Okay? Now, the plan, okay, let us just look at, I am going to look at a very regular kind of building, which has its x and y. These are the principal axes and the principal axes are aligned very nicely. Okay? Now, typically if you do 2D analysis, it is valid when you know, uh, you have at a floor, this is a floor, a floor, you have the center of mass. Let us assume that the center of mass, it is uniformly distributed and this is the center of mass. Okay. Now, you know, you have a situation that okay, you have frames aligned along this direction. So these are the primary uh, al uh, frames aligned along this direction and you have frames aligned along this direction. Okay. Now, if you have a situation where if you look at frame by frame, you look at, see a frame always has uh, its own stiffness. Remember I said that if you look at this as frame, right? I am looking at a single story frame. Remember I said that if you use lumped mass, you can actually get a k t into v t is equal to f, right? In this particular case, you can get an equivalent uh, translation, right? So, in other words, if I were to look at it as a single story building, each, each frame in each direction has its, so I will have k t x i and k t y i, which is the translational stiffness in each direction. Okay. So, now if I look at these okay, and I do, so the, these are the k t x i's, these are the align the four aligned along this direction and suppose I find out x i that uh, sorry y i that is the distance from this line the x line y i into k t x i okay? and I sum that over all the frames all frames. Okay? So, in other words this would be positive y i, this would be negative y i, I can find that all frames. Okay? If that is equal to 0, then I know 
that this is for the y direction frames, this is where the center of stiffness lies because this defines the center of stiffness. Similarly, if I do x i k t i and sum it over all the frames in the y direction, okay, then and if this comes out to be 0, I know that this is along this. So, if it is along this and it is along this, the center of stiffness is so, center of mass and center of stiffness coincide. If they coincide, 2D analysis. If they do not coincide, 3D analysis. Okay? So, if they coincide, 2D analysis is perfectly valid. So, this is very easy, right? So, you can find this out. I am talking about a single story building now. Okay, and you can find this, these x i, so the x i's are positive in this direction, negative in this direction. So, you find out and if they act up to 0, then the center of stiffness is where it is. And actually, if they are not 0, you can divide them by summation k t x i and it will give you the position along the y axis where the center of stiffness is. And by this also, you, by dividing by summation k t y i, you can find out the position of center and you can actually find out the center of stiffness. If the center of stiffness does not coincide with the center of mass, you have to do a 3D analysis. Why? Because, I will just describe this right now, I will come back to this in the next lecture, because the lateral displacements and the torsional displacement, in other words rotation of the slab, these are coupled with each other. So, there is lateral torsional coupling. If there is lateral torsional coupling, you cannot do a 2D analysis. 2D analysis will give you unconservative forces. You have to do a 3D analysis. Okay? So, I will come back to this in the next lecture and we will discuss this in a little bit more detail. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.